So if you were here last week, it was our first show of 2022. Mm -hmm. And we started um, with some questions for Janet. We've kind of compi compiled some of our most asked questions along with some fun questions. And we want you to be able to add in um, some of your questions that hopefully we can get to. And we're going to do this segment for a little while to start off the new year. Um you know, having great sewing tips and being more productive and fun and yeah. hitting the ground in 2022. Yeah, I I always uh, kind of phrase it as there's holes in everyone's sewing education because number one, there's no specific standard or outline to educate someone to sew. And so we all have holes. Some of us learn to do bomb button holes. Somebody wrote in high school. And other people have never even tried them and they're 50, 60 years old. So same thing with, um, oh, you know, we get a lot of questions on interfacings and fitting and sleeve ease. And there's just so much that nobody knows at all. But there's lots of holes, and rather than, and this is what most of us do, oh, we have a hole in our education, I don't know how to do that, so I just will pass on that project. Or I'll use a different pattern use, that doesn't yeah. have that. Or I'll use a snap instead of a button. Right, right, you know. I'll figure a way around it because I don't know how to do it. So what we're saying is, let's learn, let's fill in those holes. And there's no dumb questions. You know, a friend of mine, she invited a couple of her cousins to one of the sewing expos and gave them some tickets to go to classes. And when they reconvened in the evening back at their hotel room, she says, well, how were the classes? And everything? Oh, I liked them. Um, they said, but sometimes they talked about things we didn't know. And we were too embarrassed to ask the question. And... Don't be embarrassed to ask a question. And one of their questions was, they didn't understand straighted grain. Mm. And. Which is so important. It's like number one. And, or at least one of the tops. And so, it wasn't a stupid question. But three of them didn't know the answer. Maybe there was two or three other people in that class. So that also didn't, but were too embarrassed to ask. Because it seemed like everybody else knows what straight of the grain is or everybody else knows what stitch in the ditch is if you don't know let us help you add that to your yes. sewing knowledge and another thing that we were talking about um today at lunch when we were talking about doing the show and you know which questions should we answer this time you know what would be good is that sometimes we feel like oh my gosh we've talked about that a thousand times like we yeah. don't want to bore you guys by continuing to talk about the same thing but at the same time, this is a very fluid um, thing. Community, and it's like we yeah. have, pe yeah, community is a good um, word. We have, Josie says, I'm never embarrassed to ask questions. Good for you. Um, but, you know, maybe we've talked about something a thousand times. So in our head, we think everybody knows. And you don't. Somebody else probably doesn't either. So feel free to ask it and even if we don't can't go into depth we can send you to our other videos to the youtube page to whatever and be like give you the short answer and say the long answer is on this video and then you can um go look that up yeah so don't be afraid um and you know sometimes we're not saying my point is sometimes we're not saying stuff because it's like oh, we've told them a thousand times they're gonna get sick of hearing yeah. it janet you've said that we're tired of it but yeah <laughs> And, but like Jessica said, it's a fluid community, so we may have people on here today that are here for the first time. Or like Linda, who just retired, right? Mm -hmm. And so she's just now able to put a little more concentration into and may ask questions that... Well, be able to ask the question mm -hmm. right now and maybe we can answer it, whereas you're watching the video back, you're not likely to ask the question mm -hmm. and sometimes we don't get to see it. True. So. Um, last time we talked about uh, uh, quite a bit about fabric and the weights of fabric. Correct, yep. And Janet gave us a very short for her 
um, <laughs> recap on how she got here and how she got to be the sewing educator and owner of Islander Sewing Systems. And it the road was not as straight as you think it might be. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it does, the story does show that sewing for her has always been a passion, has always been a part of her life. So it was only natural to get here. It wasn't like, oh, a business opportunity. It was the melding of a passion and um, being an entrepreneur. True. That's a good way to put it. So you can find um, that video here on our Facebook page or on the YouTube channel as well. Islander Sewing Systems. Let me just catch up Okey -doke. on the questions. Yep, and Brenda says, sometimes I need to hear things five times before it sinks in. Well, and that is true. And whenever you're listening to a lecture or watching a show, you only catch so much of it and you only retain less than that. Um, that's just scientific information. And um, so hearing it two and three times makes a big difference. I know that I'll, when I'm trying to educate myself on something, I'll be watching a YouTube video. Oh, wait a minute. How did that work? And I have to put it back on two or three or four times to make sure I get it all. Ooh, Josie says, commenting on, we talked about fabrics and the weight of fabrics and what that means mm -hmm. last week. And she said that she found that information very beneficial and she actually uses the fabrics that she bought from us as a gauge okay. when she's looking at um, other stuff. Yeah, I think that's very wise, Josie, because that's exactly what we need to do in order. Last week, people were saying, well, how do, you know, and somebody said, I wish there was a chart. And they're really, each fabric is a different at, at the same weight. So you could have a wool and a knit and they're the same weight, but they're not the same density. You know, and they're not going to have the same drape. So it is a, a learned um, kind of by osmosis. But the more you can compare to something you have and you know it's a 2.6 and you know that weight works great in that garment, then you can look for mm -hmm. maybe not exact fiber content or exact weight, but similar. Yeah, kind of like cooking. Like, yeah. and the more you cook, mm -hmm. it's like, when you first start, you're like, one tablespoon. Yeah. You know, it's like, it has to be perfect. Okay, two, t and now you're like, a uh, tablespoon. <laughs> you know, you the more you do it, mm -hmm. the more, you know, with the fabric, the more you feel yeah. it, you get that. And getting some fabric knowledge will really serve you well. One time when we went to New York on one of our trips, one of the ladies came, and she brought a T-shirt with her. Because it was the nicest t-shirt she had ever owned. And she loved the fabric so much. But she didn't know the weight. She didn't know the fiber content. So she was going around New York trying to find that exact same fabric. And a tragedy happened. She lost the shirt? Yes. No! It's like she set it down somewhere? She set it down in one of the stores. We never did find it. And it was very disappointing. <laughs> for her I'm like oh my gosh I mean, did she, she find some fabric or I, I didn't have the nerve to ask because this was like the key thing about her trip so I'm not gonna bring up at dinner hey <laughs> were you successful I was waiting to hear but I don't think so <laughs> it's okay I'm it's just a t-shirt <laughs> it's not I can tell it's not just I a know it was very important to her <laughs> I know I felt bad for her too I mean this is like a horror story. She's, in, in New York, any of you have been there, you know that you're walking a lot of places. You have to carry everything. You're up and down the subway, you know. And we're gone to like 20 stores. And by the time she realized she lost it, she didn't know exactly where she would lost it. Anyway. Are you not going to recover right away? <laughs> but, you know, when you find that fabric that you really like, I mean, I immediately, if it's a garment. I immediately buy 40 rolls and sell it to you guys. I do that too. But I look at that label. What is the exact fiber content of this fabric? So that, you know, maybe it's got rayon in it. And when it's got rayon in a knit, that's when you get that nice fluid drapeability. 
Um, so maybe that's what I'm looking for, but whatever. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> the poor lady. I'm going to recover. <laughs> oh my gosh. I would like an update. <laughs> if you're you know, out there. Yeah. All um, I remember is she was from Canada. If you're out there. She's a Canadian. She was a very attractive woman. She was, she and her friend came and. I feel like this is one of those things that you see as like a missing connection. <laughs> like, if you found my shirt. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So on to questions for today. Okay. I'm ready. So one of the things that we talked about when we were talking about, oh my gosh, we've talked about that a thousand times, mm -hmm. right? Is how to pick out a pattern. So we've gone over, look for this, look for this, look for this. But on the flip side, I want to know, what are some of the biggest mistakes you see people make when they pick out a pattern? Like if they're unhappy with it or mm -hmm. goes wrong and then you find that mistake, what are those mistakes? Well, mistake number one is not vetting the pattern company. So unless you're buying from the main commercial pattern companies or someone that would be like us and you've bought patterns from us before and you know what you're getting. Um, I would be very careful. And the hardest thing is that I know, and don't ask me because I am not going to tell you, but I know of some very poorly made patterns and yet you can go on to some of these review sites and people will tell you it's their favorite pattern and they love it. Of course, when they post a picture of themselves in it, I, you can see all the flaws that they don't see. And so you can't even go by reviews because the average consumer may not even know. It's like when we got into the symmetrical sleeves and then people started saying, yeah, I've got t-shirts that keep pulling back. And they would be, some of them were patterns and they'd purchased and paid good money for and used and sure enough, the sleeve is symmetrical. So... Make sure you vet the company. Make sure that you know you're getting a good quality product. And then it's all about trying to choose which size to cut out. And it always helps to make a muslin. We always tell you that. We've told you, you don't have to make the whole garment. You don't have to cut out all the details. You just need the basis of the garment so you can check for fitting around the torso of the body. That's pretty much it. Shoulder shape. And, um, but if you're trying to, uh, decide what size to cut out and you look at the back of the pattern, like we have here. And so then across the top, you're going to see the sizes and you say, Oh, I wear a six. I always wear a six and ready to wear. But then I look down here and it's for a 36 to 37 inch bus, but I wear a six and I'm a 35 inch bus. What's going on here? Well, everybody has different measurements for their sizing. So first of all, do not take those sizes for granted. They're just numbers. They don't mean anything. They do not mean a thing. What means anything is number one, the measurement. So again, we're on a 2X and we got a 36 inch, uh, a bust, a 27 inch waist and a 37 inch hip. But is that going to fit me? Is it going to, if I'm not exactly 36, let's say that I'm 37 and a quarter, but do I go up to the 38 or do I stay at the 37? What do I do? Well, you come right down here to the finished garment measurements and you find out that the six to eight is got a 41 and an eighth inch finished bust. So now you know and you could even take a tape measure and kind of put it around your body and hold it at 41 and an eighth and say, oh, you know, I can see that I'm going to have ease here. You can check other garments and measure the bust area that fit you nice, that are similar that to the garment. That favorite shirt as long as you don't leave it in a store. Yeah, don't that. take it with you. So um, there's lots of ways to confirm this is going to fit me like my favorite t-shirt. This is going to fit me like my favorite jacket. Compare the finish measurements because these measurements mean nothing. You want to know why they mean nothing? Because if I've got a 36 inch bust and I'm making a t-shirt, but
but it has a 10 inch ease in it. It's not going to fit me. I don't know how much ease is in this shirt until I look at the finished garment measurements. So if I have a 36 inch bust and my finished garment measurements are 41 and an eighth, then I have five and an eighth inch ease. Am I right? 36, four, yeah. So I have five and an eighth inch ease. And once you familiarize yourself with the ease of patterns, that too will become second nature for you. You'll know that you are more comfortable in a four inch ease than a two inch. Where maybe your sister or your next door neighbor, whoever, they prefer a closer fitting garment. So they're gonna want a two inch ease. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Phyllis just said that. You know your body size and then you like to know what your ease is. So it's like after a while you start to commit that to memory. And I know even buying ready to wear, say I'm buying online, I like to see picture reviews because mm -hmm. I can tell like, oh, you like your clothes tighter than I do. Exactly. And not in a bad, like some people just prefer And the they look fit. good. They might look yeah. good. Maybe they don't have the midriff I do where I don't want my stuff close at the yeah. waist. They have a nice hourglass. So wearing it closer is good for them. So it's not just about the numbers on the pattern, but also what you prefer. Exactly. It's, it's personal taste. Uh, plus knowing like so many people tell me oh I went and bought a McCall's pattern and I made up the 12 and it fit me perfect Then I went back and I bought another McCall's pattern and a 12 and the thing is so big. I'm swimming in it Well, if you look closely a lot of times the description will say that it's oversized Or if it's been designed by someone like Izzy Miyake, it's gonna be oversized so you you know you have to take all that into consideration it isn't about the brand always because those kind of brands have several different designers they've got their in-house designers their celebrity designers and their specialty designers and so they all have their own little mark on it and so they might be slightly different we try to be consistent at islander but it isn't always a practical thing to do. So we do our very best. Now, finished garment measurements, we put them on the back of our pattern envelopes. Most, maybe our first two or three don't have it on it. A lot of companies have started doing this now. So you're going to find finished garment measurements on the back of the envelope. However, if they don't do that, um, you can actually take measurements of the pattern tissue pieces yourself. You gotta, I like silence when I'm doing it. I don't wanna be interrupted because I have to remember which pieces fit together and I have to subtract the seam allowances from all the measurements in order to know what the, when it's sewn together, what the circumference is gonna be. On a Vogue pattern and a lot of that are produced by McCall's, you'll see a circle with a, a, a cross in the middle of it and that is the exact area that the measurement was taken. It might say waist. And if it says waist, then it'll tell you for a 12, the waist was 34. For a 14, it was 36. And for a 16, it was 38 or whatever. But it'll tell you right there so you don't have to measure the pattern. So look for those little circles with the cross in them. Um, and they'll give you the bust, the waist, and the hip. And the finished... A length is really simple. Subtract the seam allowance and measure from the back of the neck to the hemline. Yep, Julian says I, if the pattern has it, I go by finished garment, finished measurements of the garment. And we were never taught that. Those of you who are in an older age group like myself, we were never taught that because they didn't exist. They weren't on the envelope. Nobody no. ever said, go buy your finished garment measurements. They said, go buy your body measurements. Well, even um, until recently when you bought ready um, to wear online, it was like small, medium, large. And it's like extra large. It's like, well, I got stuff in my closet that's a medium and I got 2XL in there. Like, how am I supposed to know? And now they're giving the finished garment measurements for that, too. I noticed so that's that, where it's all at. But one of the funny ones was, um, I don't remember what company it was, but it was a woman's jeans company. 
and they they had finished measurements so i go great what is the crotch measurement so i go and i look and it says front crotch is nine and a half or something but then in small print it says all the measurements for that were taken on a size six well i'm not a size no, six and how and i don't know your grading system so i don't know how much longer <laughs> that crotch grew when it got to my size so that was that's not helpful that's not helpful but Let's face it, most uh, garment buyers don't even know what that means, crotch length. Right, right. So They're just, yeah, especially then they just input it. Someone's just typing. Yeah. Typing what they're supposed to type. <laughs> um, so this, I like this. Deb says, I will only buy from you in the sewing workshop now. I learned this with making shirts. My shirt pattern from you works the best of all different shirt patterns I have, and the directions and explanations are the best. And I'm not reading that just because it is a very nice compliment. And thank you, Deb. But Janet's sewing workshop jacket that she's, <laughs> that she's wearing right now. So yeah, I thought that was funny. Um, let's see. Uh, I'll check into that, Connie. She says that Sunday, it says the Sunday class is full. The buttonhole class is full now? Okay. Hey, um, Brad? She's in the other room. Oh, okay. Well, you know, when it didn't say sold out, I had no idea if there was two spots or four spots. But in any of those classes, put yourself on a waiting list. If they get a large enough waiting list, they might add a, another session. But if people go, oh, well, I missed it, and they don't go on the waiting list, then they don't know people are out there that are interested. Oh, there she is. Hey, Brenda. Oh, <laughs> she did hear. Um, Brenda sees all, hears all. Okay. All right. So any other biggest mistakes? Not looking at the finished garment. Not um, vetting your uh, pattern company to make sure that they are educated and put out good patterns. Well, I don't know that uh, people make the mistake as often, but they do make it. And I would just throw this out. Always look at, and I don't know if I have one here, and I don't think I do. I cut it off when I printed that out. But always look at the line art, the illustration, where you just see the silhouette of the garment and all the seam lines. Not like a photograph. Right. So when you see the seam lines, it's usually on the back of the pattern. Well, these are already on the front, but yeah. when, see, they'd be like this. So now you see that it's got princess seams. You see how many pieces and how they all fall together. That's what you want to see. Sometimes I have people um, discouraged with a pattern because they bought it, and then they found out that it had 27 pieces to it. And they were used to sewing with four or five piece patterns. So take a look at that. And that's how you can tell without opening up the envelope is just look at all the seam lines. And you'll see, does this have a lot of detail? Does it have darts? Does it have a zipper? You can see all that in those illustrations. And so that can also help you decide if it's the right jacket for you. And, and a lot of times, especially when the pattern company has an artist do the cover art like a drawing or a painting yeah it's not real we don't know if the proportions are correct so sometimes and then i can remember years ago buying a pattern where the jacket what well, looked like it was very close fitting and i really liked it but it was an illustration i made it and it was a drop shoulder oversized jacket but the illustration and the description didn't tell me that Mm. You know, so you got to be careful with those illustrated pattern covers. Look for actual photographs. They'll give you a better interpretation. And what happens to us a lot when we see illustrations that aren't photographs, our imagination gets carried away. Well, it's like, and it's also like seeing a model in the garment. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like that perfectly shaped model that perfectly unproportioned drawing yes. you yes. know it's yep. like oh well the artist made this and it makes it all look beautiful but and you know what they do um i took fashion illustration in college you know what they do the average human being if you draw drew a human being to scale is six heads high so that would be the 
length of your head six times. In fashion illustration, they do 10 to 12 heads high. So when they do illustrations like that, garments look entirely different when your legs go from here to Christmas. You know, oh, that looks great, but I'm five foot two. That's not going to look like that on me. And I don't have those same angles and shapes. So though those fashion illustrations always make everything look really great, but they're not necessarily realistic. Friday is not Sunday. not Sunday. Oh, my mistake. Okay. Well, that's where it all went wrong. We didn't okay. get the time wrong. We got the day wrong. So the buttonhole class. See, now we do it too. 11 o'clock. Yeah. I was having a mad moment. <laughs> Thanks, Val. <laughs> I got a new phrase. A uh, new excuse. Okay. Uh, but it is the 11 o'clock, but it's on Friday. Mm, is that March? I'm not going to say that because I'll get I'll it look. wrong. Oh, Third March, or fourth? No, March. Fourth. Nope, fourth. that's February. March fourth. Still, still March 4th. March 4th is uh, is the day of the class. So you can still get into that buttonhole class, but hurry because everybody just heard me. <laughs> I don't know how many spots are left. But we had Brand to check it, so we know it's right this time. Yeah. Yes. Um. Okay, so that's a good that's a good tip too. Mary says when you purchase a pattern from an individual, so like Janet owns her own company, um, we know, and I don't know who Mary's talking about, but um, you know uh, Linda Lee's sewing workshop, you know stuff like that. She says um, you have to look at how they wear their own clothing. One popular pattern maker wears her tops too tight for me. And again, that's too tight for your own personal thing. So I know I would have to make a few sizes up for my measurements. Well, you make a very good point. I remember that in uh, mm, a number of years ago, we had an association of pattern designers. And it was the independents. And it was very interesting when somebody pointed this out. And I didn't see it myself. But every designer, except for two of us, designed for them all, their own self, their own aesthetic, their own body type. So let's take Lila Messenger, for example. She had the mm -hmm. LJ designs. Lila was, oh, I don't know, 5'10 or 11 oh, or yeah. maybe 6 foot. I don't know. But she's tall and very thin. And all of her garments, and this is how these people started. They started making their own garments. And then people came up to them. I know because this happened to me. I I want one of those. Can you? Will you make me the pattern? Will you sell me the pattern? Whatever. And eventually you go, well, okay. And that's how it all evolves. So most of those women are home sewers that had a passion. And they took what worked for their aesthetic and built it into a business. Now, Connie Crawford and I were the two that didn't do that. Because we, you're not a man. Yeah, I started out making menswear <laughs> to begin with, men's shirts. But it wasn't to me about, mine was always based on creating patterns for the public. Not, I didn't start with creating them just for me. Because I started making a line to sell, as you remember, Jess. And so my line to sell was all about, well, what will they buy? Not what do I like? I learned real quick, who cares what I like? It's what the public will buy, and color-wise and style-wise mm -hmm. both. So, um, yeah, so they just come from different directions. But you're absolutely right. Look at who that designer is and how they wear their clothes. And, you know, you find somebody who is uh, your similar. similar shape or style. Like I had a friend the other day, and... She's, uh, her body has changed drastically and she goes, I don't even know where to start. And I said, you should start with this one particular designer because she's built like you, mm -hmm. you know, and her clothes look really good on her. I can't wear her clothes because they're both almost six foot tall. That's what Cassie said. As a five foot nine woman, everything is too short on me. Yeah. And as a five foot one, it's all too, too long. long. Yeah. <laughs> 
But again, it's like, it doesn't mean um, that I wouldn't buy Lila's patterns because she's tall no, and no. thin. But you know, just like Mary was saying, like, you know what you might need to do to that pattern or what size pattern you want to make opposed to um, what their random size is along the top. Right, right. Um... Okay, anything, any other big pattern mistakes? I don't, I can't think of any at the okay. moment. It's all about picking the right size and understanding the ease. All right, I have another one, not so serious. But I've heard, this is not a controversial question. You okay. know how sometimes you have those little, like, controversial questions. It's not a controversial one, but I have... Heard many of lengthy conversations about this one. Oh, I'm, I'm curious now. When you sew, are your shoes on or off? Oh, yes. This is um, a lot of people. This you, is you all opinion can weigh in. only. Opinion only. Just you, for fun. You can all weigh in. But I have had people in my classes who swear they cannot sew unless they're barefoot. Can't do it. I always have my shoes on. But I, um, as I shared with you when we did the studio tour, this is a converted garage um, that my studio's in. And it had, it's a concrete floor and it had some carpet down. Well, I did a lot of painting and dye work, so that carpet really got, um, uh, I'm not going to replace it. And I don't want to spend the money it would take to put in a flooring on a concrete floor. So... I just leave that old carpet in there. But guess what catches in a carpet? Pins. And yes, we do have some pins around here. So I always make my grandkids put their shoes on before they come out here. It's too. a rule. Everybody knows it's a rule. You don't come in here without shoes. Yeah. So I, that's the reason I uh, sew with shoes on. But a lot of you feel a whole lot more comfortable uh, barefoot or stockings. Oh, Phyllis says shoes on and her floor is concrete too. It's too cold. Yeah. Yeah. Way too cold. Too cold for Janice. Yeah, that uh, when you have a concrete floor and you live in a cold climate, that cold just comes right up into your bones. It's just, <laughs> Brenda and I complain about it. Sometimes it's just awful. Okay, Bev has a good one. Okay. You, you might have heard this one before. Shoes always off. I sew with my big toe and the foot pedal backwards. Well, what do you know about that's that's, that's a new like one. a circus trick. <laughs> <laughs> I like it, but you know what? That's the it's your hobby, and when you find what works for you, there's it can't be wrong. It just can't be wrong if it works for you. I've I just am curious how. Like, you know, you hear these stories about like, oh, well, I just started and I didn't know what to do. So I just put the foot pedal backwards. And then is that how it started? Or were you like, I don't know, I'm going to try this one day and see that it works better for you. That's fun. Uh, lots of slippers. Uh, Jillian says, I keep my slippers near, but I can't sew with shoes or slippers. Chantel wears her shoes. Oh, Linda's just whatever. Whatever. She goes both ways. Yeah, she's, shoes on, shoes she off. She goes both ways. <laughs> yeah. Whatever is clever for, for Linda. Um, I meant, I guess I must be like, I'm not, I, I, oh, it's a rule. You have to have shoes on in here. But at home. But at home, I don't think I think about it. Yeah. I just well, go you, with whatever. Got hardwood floors, and so it's not as dangerous. Well, I have so in the basement. Yeah. But. You just don't think about it. I just, whatever I have, I guess it doesn't, I don't feel. For some people, that's really important. And it's that feeling, I think, some people probably get in the groove of the feel. Like, this doesn't feel right with the yeah, shoe on yeah, or with yeah. the shoe off. It doesn't feel right. Uh, for uh, Bev, it just doesn't feel right if the foot pedal isn't back right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's fun. Okay, so Janet is shoes on. Yeah, and I just always have. So, I mean, I can I can do it barefoot. Oh, Patricia, barefoot, but if it's the dead of winter, she'll put on some socks. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I know some people just say they just feel more in control and more, it's a more of a comfort zone thing, so. 
And again, it can't be wrong. Oh, and Bev, you've helped out. Josie's going to try it, I think. She says, I love the backwards tip. I have shin splints, and I think that would help me. Ooh. Now, when we're talking about the foot pedal, I have a couple of tips. So one of them is there was an ergonomic company. Anna Zapp was the originator. And she had different ergonomic things, but she has... It's, it's about this kind of an angle, and it's to set your foot pedal on yes. so that it's already angled so when you put your foot up there. But here's the issue. When you've got one foot raised and one foot not raised, you're um, misaligning your hips, so you don't want to do that. You want to keep both knees, you know, we talk about the ergonomic keeping both knees bent. The other tip that I've used a lot, because I do have carpet, and people talk about the foot paddles slipping, mm -hmm. sliding around the room. I got some from the office supply store, Velcro, the sticky kind, put it on the bottom of my foot pedal. Mm -hmm. I have a carpet, and I just have old, like I said, it's old ratty uh, indoor, outdoor carpet. And it just sits right there and it never moves. As a matter of fact, if you want it to move, you got to get down and yeah. pull it off <laughs> and put it where you want it. But I have used that uh, for many years. And Claudia says, has anyone ever gotten a leg cramp at night after sewing all day? No. Maybe you did. You didn't put it together. But who knows? Okay. And then Patty left shoe off. Are you telling me you're a one shoe on, one shoe off sewer? But, that, but does she sew with the right foot? I, she... I don't know. That's all she said. I'm very intrigued. <laughs> Maybe it's a superstition. Maybe she doesn't have to rip as much when she takes one shoe off. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Josie is never barefoot. She's making this very clear. Josie will never be barefoot ever. Okay. She's a, she's a never barefoot. Um, yep, and Celine said the same thing, that she's always chasing the foot pedal, and Brenda said um, she uses the grippy liner, the shelf grippy liner, mm -hmm. yep, or you can use those, um, the things that go under the rugs. Yep, yep, there's lots of options to keep that thing from sliding, but if you've got carpet, that Velcro, oh, it's yeah. Heck going yeah, Cassie. nowhere. Cassie says, I show, sew in my pajamas. Mm -hmm. Yes, most comfortable. Be the most comfortable. Okay, then I'll go to another question. But back kind of to the patterns. Pam has a question. Okay. She says, I know this is a different pattern company. Um, it's Vogue. But I don't get their symbols because you talked about the circle with the cross. Yes. She says they have a circle, rectangle, triangle. Those are body shapes. So if that's on their pattern, they have identified somewhere, and it might have to be on their website or in the extra tiny print in their directions. And so they have the rectangle, the oval, the square. So those are kind of like the apple, the pear, the whatever, the body shapes. So they're saying that they've determined that those body shapes will look good in the silhouette of this pattern. I don't always agree with them on that, and I don't think that it's all that. All that. I think that by a certain age, we know what we kind look good in. Kind of know what you look good in and yeah. what you don't. Or maybe you don't care. And those body shapes don't take into consideration your height, and that makes a difference too. That's right. That's right. I know this. Okay, so now I I feel enlightened by everybody's shoe status while sewing. <laughs> it's a fun one. Um, so I will ask you a very loaded question. Uh oh, look you out! You could people. be here all day, folks. Get a snack. Uh, I'll narrow it to three. Okay. Of your biggest sewing pet. Peeves. Okay, well, I think my biggest pet peeve, because it's so important to me 
to set people up for sewing success is the naughty pattern designers. Naughty. Very naughty. <laughs> that either do one of two things. They either do a terrible job of making a pattern, which includes those symmetrical sleeves that we've talked about, and the lack of, uh, and symmetrical arm size that are just absurd. Um, and make you feel like you put your shirt on backwards. Um, or, and this is the really naughty part, they take somebody else's pattern and just knock it off and call it their own. And that happened to me even recently, within the last couple of years, by a very naughty person. The best part, it was um, advertised to me on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, hmm, this looks very familiar. And previous to this, that person had a pattern similar to ours, but it didn't have a very important detail in it. Now it is our pattern, and it's very frustrating because there's really not much we can do about it, nor do I want to, but with that limited amount of knowledge and thinking that you can put patterns out, inevitably all kinds of things go wrong. You knock off somebody's pattern. Well, this is a pattern I've even done a video on, so I don't know how she could go wrong because um, she's got everything, all the details. Um, <clears throat> but um, when they just knock off a pattern, they don't know what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong, and sometimes they knock off mistakes. And in the meantime, they're charging you for it. And a lot of these pattern designers are the PDF only pattern makers because they have such limited knowledge and experience. Even they aren't going to put the thousands of dollars it takes to put in and print professionally a large quantity of a pattern. But they can just, they know how to run a computer, so they throw some stuff in there and then they set you up for failure and they take your money. And that frustrates me. And the reason we started that association I told you about back, I don't know, must be 20 years now, was because this is what was starting to happen back then. So pattern makers would come along, or they're not really pattern makers because they wouldn't know how to draft uh, to save their life, pattern copiers, and they were doing a horrible job. And I would hear consumers in the aisles of the trade shows going, well, I'm never buying another independent pattern because that one was just awful. And there was one lady who had the cutest designs. I'm not kidding. They were adorable. And she came out with like 10 or 12 patterns at one time. She made them in one size only. Size 14. So then when we the consumer would buy it, they'd get home, they'd find out, well, this is only one size and I don't wear a 14. What do I do now? Her solution was just take a pinch out of the back, center back seam or add to the side seams. You want to make it smaller? She would grab the back of the neck and say, here, see, now it fits. Well, yeah, if you're going to walk around holding the back of my jacket all day. But no, it doesn't really fit. And adding to the side seams, we all know what's going to happen. You're going to have an armhole and a sleeve that's giant if you had to go from a 14 to a 22. So she didn't know what she was doing. She had cute ideas, but she didn't know what she was doing when it came to pattern making. So those people frustrate me. They make the rest of us all look silly because like I said, people get very weary of independent pattern makers. So that's one of my pet yeah. peeves. Or just the, like when we have the pattern, we say, hey, call us, we can help you. Yes. But when somebody rips that off, there's not much no, that we, they can do to help you because it was not their idea. Did you lose your paper? I lost my notes. Um, yes. Yes, that is very true. Nor can they help you, nor... I mean, they would give the same kind of advice this lovely woman did. And she was a lovely woman. <laughs> I really liked her, but she didn't know what she was doing at all. Oh yes. So to be just to be clear, your pet peeve is anybody ripping anybody off. Not it wasn't just about people ripping 
us off. Oh yeah, because no, you are com but... Janet is confident in in her patterns in business and education, yeah. but just in general because it waters down the industry and the education sure. that is out there, and it's not fair to the consumers. There was one company that's not out there anymore, but they totally only knocked off the big three. So they weren't knocking off another independent. They were knocking off Simplicity McCall's and Buttery. But, um, yeah. So, yes. anyway. And Jillian makes a good point. People like that make persons new to sew and get discouraged yes. and want to quit because... Yeah. You're putting all your effort into that pretty picture on the front. Exactly. That is what's going to draw a lot of new or younger sewers in. And then once they get it open, immediately. Well, yeah, when they're not successful, when the directions are lacking in detail or the pattern pieces don't fit together or the notches don't line up, they don't know when you're a beginner or even an intermediate sometimes, you don't know, is that my mistake? Did I do something wrong? Uh, maybe I just don't belong in the sewing because I don't understand this. Try to consider that maybe the person who made that pattern doesn't belong in pattern making. They shouldn't have sold you a product that was inferior. So I could go, like Jessica knew, this would uh, get me riled up. Okay, so that was what? really bothers me. Um, inferior interfacings is another one. And I think you all know that. That's why we carry a, uh, three better interfacings. And we may be looking into a couple more, but don't quote me on that. We're going to talk about that this week. Um, but things like the pressed fibers, the Pellon interfacing, it's not good for anything other than crafts. So it's disappointing when you go to a box store and that's all they have is that interfacing. So the consumer, again, like Jessica's talking, new people, they don't know, well, that must be all, what interfacing is because they don't know there's a plethora of different types and styles and better interfacings. And then right along with the same concept of people who set you up for failure with poorly made patterns is sewing teachers that, that are teaching things they've made up or maybe they don't even know. There is, there are teachers out there, and again, don't ask me who they are because I'm not naming them, but they claim to be experts, actually almost call them, title themselves experts, and yet symmetrical sleeves, symmetrical arm size. They don't know how to draft. No one who knows how to draft would draft that way. They're either just drawn around something. I don't know how they even come up with these poor patterns. Well, no, wait a minute. I think I do sometimes because there are some really inexpensive pattern software. And that's what some of these people are using. And it's really those software, unless you have a degree in pattern drafting, and then you pull your hair out trying to use those softwares because they have so many glitches in them. But you wouldn't know you they they sell you the software and they say oh you can make your own patterns you just plug in your measurements and it'll spit out your pattern here's the problem no matter how sophisticated the software is there is likely things that will need to be trued up or corrected at, at the very least tested but what i see with some of these companies is, is they plug in the numbers they spit out the pattern they put it in an envelope and they sell it to you they don't even make a garment from it and therefore, they don't know what the errors are, and they don't really care because they got their money. These people frustrate the heck out of me. And the same thing happens with the teachers. They come up with some uh, method that worked for them, and so then they teach everybody to do that. You know, I've talked to you about sewing on an inside curve, how it's important to honor the curve and to feed the fabric in on the curve. But there will be teachers out there that say, oh, you just straighten that out. Well, first of all, she came up with that because it worked for her. But she doesn't know the impact it made on her final garment. And how it either slightly or dramatically skewed the neckline or whatever that curve was. And that's why it doesn't look as nice as fine ready to wear. It's got the homemade look. Well, and maybe that technique can be can work 
in this one garment. Like you can fake get it. away with you it. You can get away you with get it. Away but with then it. you use that technique on a different garment. Or a different fabric. Yeah. Different fabrics. A different fabric stretch more than others. And that's where it would all go wrong. And instead of uh, studying uh, uh, garment construction, going to school or learning, they just say, oh, yeah, I can teach. I'll sign up to teach at that show, at that expo, at that fabric store. And so then along come people who think that you should put darts in T-shirts or that you can zigzag a T-shirt hem and stretch it out and then by using a steam iron, it'll all go back into place. That's another pattern designer. And it was just appalling to see these things because not only could they be further from the truth, they're setting you up for a very poor looking garment. So, um, yeah, so those are my pet peeves. You're saying there's a very big difference between like, say I'm sitting down with my friend and I'm like, oh, I can't figure out how did this works. And they're like, this is what works for me. Yeah. You know, that's one thing. And it's like, eh, okay, I'll try that than paying somebody exactly. to, with authority, tell you, do this. Yeah. But it's the same tip. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's yeah. like, well, this works for, I figured out this works for me. Maybe it'll work for you. Is different than the science behind it, the mathematics behind I, it, I, all of that, and knowing. And actually knowing. Yes. You know, doing your due diligence. And unfortunately, the hobby of sewing really waned when women went back to work or when women went to work okay so it waned and it continued to wane uh for the last 50 years and so people just uh need a teacher they want to learn and somebody says oh i'll do it and they might not even be a good teacher but um they might be a, a wonderful person and very pleasant to spend time with but what they taught you was bunk or unsuccessful and uh so just i don't know that's i i don't know how to fix it yeah uh but it's basically because all of a sudden people wanted sewing teachers so anybody could hold up their hand and say i'll teach mm -hmm. there wasn't a, there's no certification there's no special uh license uh to confirm to you the consumer you the student this is the right teacher. This is a good teacher. Um, I mean, there's lots of excellent ones out there. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, in the couture world, Kenneth King, uh, Susan Calgy. Oh, they have such excellent information. Um, I don't couture sew, so, so it's not stuff that I use, but I, I know that they are both excellent teachers. Sandra Bettina, sewing so her whole life. It's been her whole business. She knows her stuff. That's why I pointed out her books last week. Um, there are some superior uh, experts in our field, but there is more that are not. Well, there's a key too. Um, if you are looking, like we talk about looking for a good pattern, looking for a good teacher. And one of the major um, feedback comments we get about Janet as a teacher is that she explains why. Here's what you do. And this is why you do it. So if someone tells you this is what you do and can't explain to you why, other than it just works, yes, then they probably don't know why. And I've taken classes from those kind of people before. But what it is, is that, and I've had this happen to me, they take my class. Somebody comes along and takes my class. And I walked into a guild meeting a month later and someone who had taken my class was teaching my class. In your own guild? Yeah. Ooh. And Feisty. Well, she wasn't expecting me to be there. Oh. And But of all the nerve, it took me several years of study and honing that class down to make it the best way to deliver the information for the student. And you learn those things by working hard and trial and error and feedback. And she takes it all and takes my hand out and photocopies it and thinks that she is as worthy of teaching it as me who spent years developing it. 
it's it's frustrating, but I see that all the time. I've had people come up to me when I ran the expo and they'd say, hey, I just took a class yesterday on jacket making. I think I could teach that at your expo. What do you think? And no, <laughs> no, because you just took the class. You didn't make the jackets. You go make 15 jackets and you come back and talk to me. And then you're ready to teach it. So um, some people will probably just get a little ahead of themselves. So a theme I think we can see in Janet's pet peeves involve things that make it harder for the sewer, mm -hmm. for the sewist. I thought that was someone's pet peeve. Um, for the person doing the sewing. Um, because not only we've talked a lot, like Janet loves to sew, she has this business, but this is her passion. So just like she'll answer your emails about how to fix something or how to do something, it's because she wants everybody to have a sec successful experience, whether it be our pattern or someone else's pattern. Now don't go writing her a ton of questions about someone else's pattern, but you know what <laughs> techniques, I mean. Techniques, Techniques and stuff like that is that she wants everybody to have a successful experience. So it's not just about people being maybe immoral with their actions or their unethical. business or unethical. It's about what that does for you, what that does for all the people who sew out there and when they have a bad experience and then, well, I don't wanna do this anymore, this isn't easy, or I bought five patterns and none of them fit me right, or none of them did put together like the way that they said they would. They don't look like the picture. And I won't wear them out to um, a wedding or a banquet or to work because they look homemade. So those kind of things, um, they just don't have to be. They don't have to be. We've got enough information now, especially from Margaret and Connie, bringing industry information to the consumer. Um, and Kenneth and Susan bringing couture. And Sandra bringing great quality uh, knowledge about fabrics and uh, techniques and interfacings and how to handle different situations. Well, careful, Jillian, because we are on YouTube. <laughs> she said her Jillian's husband is listening, and he said that there are a lot of people like that. He calls it the YouTube generation. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, we very much like YouTube. We are on YouTube. But I know what he's saying. Anybody can load a video to YouTube these days and say, I know what I'm doing. Oh, yeah. yeah. My favorite was the young girl. She was probably about 12. And she was doing a YouTube video on how to use a curling iron on your hair. And she curled her hair, and then she went on to explain it for getting to take the curling iron out of her hair. When she took the curling out of, iron out of her hair, she had burnt the hair Oh, right she didn't off. take the curling iron out. No. As she was talking, the curling iron falls. But, yeah, and the whole lock sort of, of hair, hair, and she's just left in front of the camera with this horrified look on her face. So I wouldn't take advice from her on doing my hair, <laughs> poor thing. But yeah, as people get excited, they learn something and they think, oh, I want to share this with everybody. I know that feeling. I've done that. But it, it's a different thing when you decide that it's going to be a business and that you're going to take people's money. <laughs> That's when you need, yeah. you need to, you know, come on. Put a little work in. Yeah. Okay. So that's what we have for this week. If you guys have any other questions, um, put them in the comments, send us an email, and we can add them. Um, if we can, we'll squeeze them in. I want to remind them about what we have on sale this week. Sure, do it. And that is fitting. So uh, on the website, we put a new link uh, page called fitting. So all fitting is on that page. But uh, check the newsletter, but you're going to find out that Connie's... Um, Videos on fitting are on sale. All of Connie's uh, slopers, including children's, adults. We got leggings, pants, bodices, uh, all kinds of kids stuff in, in many sizes. Uh, the pant drafting and fitting with the workbook. All of those things are 20% off for the week. So the sale ends next Monday. So take a look if you want to start out the year um, getting your slopers together so that you everything you make for the rest of the year, you know it's going to fit right before you sew it up. 
that's always my favorite uh, good feeling for sewing. Um, I put the link in the comments to that specific And there thing. is, the and the kit, the Wovis, uh, Wovis. Wovis! The Woven uh, Bodice Kit. I don't know if we put the knit t-shirt kit in there, but we should have. So we'll put that one in there too if it's not in there. So the Knit Fit Kit and the Woven Bodice Kit are also part of that whole fitting series. And I'm here to help you as um you know as a you as a tuesdays at two uh community member when you make up a slo sloper and you followed all the directions <clears throat> and it's not fitting right and you're not sure what to do we've got a primer for you on how to take photographs that and send them to me and then i'll be able to critique it and put notes and send back and tell you just what you need to do to get the final fitting. Did Brenda in here? She going in. Brenda, yeah. do we have that fitting primer on the website under something? I believe it's there. Yeah, is it on the fitting page? Yeah. Okay, so you'll find that on the fitting page. It's a PDF download. You can uh, print it out, and you just follow those steps. We also have both the knit fit series and the woven bodice fitting series on. YouTube in the playlist so you could go and review those um, or you can use Connie's um, DVDs but in any case generally everyone has like either some little hiccup they can't quite figure out in the fitting or they just want to confirm they're they're on in the right direction and they send me pictures so everything uh, will be there to give you the proper direction on uh, getting those pictures to me um okay so they did not forget about that photo you were gonna look for oh she did though did you look no and no no just no well i know what it's in but i don't know where that's at it's a little uh album from my high school um but everything's torn up right now. We're doing a little remodeling, so it might take me a couple weeks. Oh, I'll oh, put your dad on it. He's, oh. he's good at finding stuff. I'll put him on it. Okay, and then, um, Brenda, yes, we did pick the Easy Shirt winner. Oh, yeah. It was, was it Arlene? Yes, Arlene Moore. Oh, okay. Yes, we picked that last week, Brenda. Which you were here last week, Brenda. Maybe you were distracted by Amy's ball at the beginning. <laughs> we picked the winner. Uh, yeah, we had some really great um, finished easy shirt entries. And we pulled Arlene, I believe, as the winner. Yes, Arlene confirmed it. There we go. Bingo, bingo. Um, so we have gotten several questions from you, um, and we are, uh, if we haven't touched the subject, we are working on, um, presenting something, uh, on those subjects. So keep those coming. Yeah. Question, the whole, think about it. What is the hole in your sewing education? What do you avoid? Do you avoid, uh... Invisible zippers? Do you avoid buttonholes? Do you avoid things that have yokes in them or inset pockets? What is your thing that just you just don't feel comfortable doing? Maybe you'd like to learn. Yeah, anything. Shout it out, Islander Sewing at Comcast.net for your questions. Um, tech, uh, your questions on techniques, patterns, fabric. Fun stuff. Just yeah, anything you just like to solve a mystery, fill a hole in your education, whatever it is. Um, something you've always we, been curious about. We want to help. Yeah. Yeah. All right, and we will be back next week. I think we got everything. All right. Thanks for coming. We'll see you next Tuesday at 2 for Islander Sewing Systems. With Janet Prey, Jessica Johnson. Bye. Bye.